podium because I've written this out, which is something I don't regularly do, but I am humbled and honored. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the students for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Carly and Lorian, if she's here for the uh, assistance in getting ready for this. Uh, thank you to Reed Mueller, uh, I don't think is here right now, for uh, helping, with, helping me with uh, appear like I know anything about technology, <laughs> <laughs> which is really misleading. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, especially to the students. Uh, you mean a lot to me. I hope that this is something that you uh, will enjoy. Uh, I also have to note there are some people here, and I'll start with uh, a person that I've known perhaps longest here at Concordia. Uh, Art Wallers was the, I think you were called the academic dean when I was hired. And I was hired in 1976. And I was a little suspect, I think, uh, because everybody on the faculty interviewed me. Literally, everybody on the faculty interviewed me, I think, to test whether I was acceptable. And to tell you the truth, when I was first hired, I had no idea I would be here this long. I was just certain that I would be uh, you know, moving on in a few years. But Concordia gets into you. Uh, it's uh, into a place because it is about people and I, I think people stay here because of people and because they feel a sense of community because they feel like they can connect with students and that's certainly my story as to why I stayed. There's also a three and a half month old somewhere in the audience so it's a wide range of uh, ages here. And again, thank you to the students for coming. Let me introduce uh, my family who came, some of whom are going to be the subject of stories, which may embarrass them or me. Uh, so if you could stand up, let me just quickly introduce you and face the audience. <laughs> That's my daughter. <laughs> Would you mind? If you could all stand up. Um, let me start quickly with my two sisters. This is Margie and Virginia, and Margie's husband, Henry. Uh, these are people who have known me longer than I was here, and there is a story having to do with my sisters about the first year I was here. Uh, this is my grandson, Skyler. Uh, who goes to University of Oregon. He will be the subject of a story. <laughs> My daughter, Laurel, uh, Skylar's mother, uh, she also, I don't like to stand up, <laughs> uh, she also is the subject of a story. Uh, Shane is Laurel's husband. Um, I've known you so long now. <laughs> and uh, Shane's mother, Annie Durham, is here uh, coming down from, and, my sisters came down from Puyallup, and Annie came from near Puyallup, uh, what's the name of it? Lake Taps, and uh, Abigail uh, Parrott uh, came down. So thank you for coming, and I hope I don't embarrass you with the stories. <laughs> um, so the last lecture is, as probably most of you know, uh, it started in 2007 with Randy Posh who was a teacher at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And he, in fact, was dying of cancer. And it was literally uh, his last lecture. And the idea was that he would share uh, some insights uh, with uh, students and others. And if you want, and I encourage you to do that, uh, his lecture is on YouTube. And so you could watch Andy, uh, Andy Posh's lecture. Uh, he has some wise things to say. I can't claim that. I can only claim that I will try to share some of my experience and you could decide if there's any wisdom in it. Um, and to be clear, I'm not dying. That I'm <laughs> or only dying in the sense that we're all dying. That, that is if you recall uh, or hearing it for the first time, uh, Bob Dylan said, he not busy being born, busy dying. Uh, so we'll see whether I die. 
Uh, another one, uh, more serious, uh, my dad died um, 10 years ago. And uh, when we uh, arranged for his funeral, uh, there was a wonderful writer, there is a wonderful writer, Annie Dillard. And Annie Dillard said in her book, uh, Pilgrim to Tinker Creek, she said, I think at the end, the dying pray, not please, but thank you. And I, I think there's great wisdom in that. And really that's the perspective I'm coming from tonight, which is I'm hoping to thank you uh, for all the wonderful experiences I've had with you. Again, I'm humbled and honored, and so thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to look at this at least every now and again. So it's called The Last Lecture, and there's the name of it. So let me talk about the title of the lecture. It's called The Journey of the Hero. I don't claim to be a hero, uh, except perhaps in the sense that I'll talk about tonight. Um, so we'll talk something about what heroes do. I teach a course on heroes, and what's really interesting, I've been teaching the course for at least 20 years, and every single time I teach it, I get the most amazing students who have the greatest wisdom, and I'm not just saying this, I learn something from them every time I teach that course, and they help me understand the reason I do what I do. Um, the second part of the title, A Life in the Movies, uh, I'm not in the movies, um, so let me explain what I mean by that. I love movies. I watch maybe 200 or so movies a year, and so it probably could be called a life at the movies. Uh, we spend a lot of time in the movies. So what I really mean, again, will come through in the lecture, is a life in the movies. Is that life is a drama, and we're all participating in the dramas of our lives. And so, in a certain sense, our lives are movies, and uh, we play some kinds of roles in those movies. And that's the reason I chose the title for the lecture that way. And there, I'm going to make three main points tonight, and I'm aware that I follow in big footsteps. Uh, Chuck Hooter, who has taught me so much, uh, and we argued with each other, uh, which we did on a regular basis. Uh, I learned so much from him, and I think he and I have just deep, deep respect for each other. And he's given uh, a last lecture two years ago. Julie Rowland gave it last year, uh, another person from whom I learned a lot. And I, I want to thank you for your wisdom. Um, so the three points I'm going to make is, number one, Life is a journey full of mystery, pain, and joy. I think there's no way around that, so I'll talk more about that. Uh, the second point is we must wake up if we're going to experience that journey. Uh, there's a drama going on in our lives, and I'll tell you about how I learned about that drama. And the third point is the purpose of our lives is to pay it forward. I, in a certain sense, simply the, the product, the maybe enthusiastic product of all the people that have helped me grow, who have helped me be the person that I am today. So I want to pay it forward a little bit. And I do think of my career as paying it forward. And I'll talk about some of the people that I have learned from who have helped me. Um, but let me start by saying, I stand in front of you, I'm a, I'm a fraud, uh, I'm, a, I'm a phony, uh, because I'm not the kind of, I'm not what I appear to be. Uh, I'm really not a scholar, I know so little, I've read so few books. Uh, I sometimes am, am thought of as a social activist, and, and yet I've done too little, I haven't done enough. I'm inspired by people who do more. Um, as a teacher, I've worked really hard at it, but the truth of it is, even after 38 years, I'm simply learning what the classroom is about. Um, as a seeker of truth, which is something I talk a lot about, the truth of it is, it's about seeking, not about what I've discovered. 
and I, again, know very little. And so there's a sense in which I'm a fraud. Over the years, I've pretended to be a number of things, and I pretended to be a jock. Uh, I pretended to be a hippie. Um, I pretended to be a parent. I pretended to be a teacher. I pretended to be a scholar. I pretended to be a social activist. But the truth of it is, I'm still a working class kid from the central area in Seattle. And in that sense, it's important that you know that about me if you want to know the real me. Uh, and so let me just show you uh, at least a couple pictures. Uh, so, yeah, so you can say, aw. <laughs> um, I have one older brother uh, who has passed and uh, three uh, younger sisters, uh, two of whom are here tonight. And this is a picture of me sitting on a stoop. Um, I was cute, wasn't I? <laughs> Uh, or this, how about that? Uh, sitting on a Santa's lap. Uh, I don't know, how old was I there? Four or something like that. Uh, or this one, my first communion. Uh, don't I look holy? <laughs> As I said, I'm a fraud. <laughs> but I've tried to pretend to be these things, and uh, there was one time at Gonzaga, which I have a great fondness for. And all the things that I experienced at Gonzaga, I, I'm trying to pay them forward. I had some wonderful teachers I'll talk about. But at Gonzaga, we had a party one time in our dorm, and it was at, around the theme of Halloween. And uh, the theme was that the uh, dorm was set up as a uh, cemetery. And there were, we all dressed up in some kinds of costumes. And in the cemetery, there were uh, epitaphs or grave markers with epitaphs for each one of us. And, and I've always thought by epitaph, they knew that I was a fraud uh, because they said, here lies Dick Hill, who died trying to be articulate. <laughs> <laughs> I was always trying. Um, or another one which, um, has to do with uh, my sisters. I have three, and they came down uh, with Henry, and uh, the family came down to see me. The very first year I was here in 1976, and it was like uh, September. School had just started, and uh, I wanted to show them campus. And by the way, campus was very, very different in 1976. Uh, but I was showing them around campus, uh, proud of my new job. And uh, again, I grew up as a working class kid. Uh, and I'll talk about my neighborhood because that's a big part of what I'm paying forward. Uh, but Margie and Virginia were there and um, we were walking across campus and a student came by us and said, good afternoon, Dr. Hill. And my sisters just fell out. <laughs> they knew that, uh, they knew me before I was a doctor. And, <laughs> I, I hope they won't, but they could tell stories on me that uh, would suggest, again, that I, that I have lots still to learn, <laughs> but thank you for coming. Um, the, the, the first year of teaching here was uh, a baptism of fire, and one of the reasons I mentioned that is because some of you are graduating, and, and I hope I can pass on at least a little wisdom tonight. Those of you who are graduating, I, I hope you've received a good education. I hope you've worked hard. And I know many of you have. But there's no possible way that your education will prepare you for your first job. It's going to be a baptism of fire. Uh, because what you'll realize is that uh, life isn't about doing well on tests. And life isn't about winning. Ultimately, all of us get humbled uh, about life. Chuck Hillard was right two years ago when he said, the times we fail are more important than the times when we succeed, because we can learn from our failures. Um, so that's the first bit of wisdom for the night, which is another way of saying that life is a journey. It's full of mystery. We don't know. And it's hard to put into words the things that we do know. It involves a lot of pain. And 
I don't want to leave out that it also involves a lot of joy. Uh, but my realization that I hope makes sense to you, uh, I'm, I suggest I've come a long way. I was a child in the 50s, and I grew up uh, in a wonderful family. My dad and mother uh, worked hard, and they tried to provide for me. Uh, but it was a time when children weren't encouraged to question. It was a time when uh, children weren't encouraged to explore. Uh, I had wonderful people around me, wonderful teachers uh, in the Catholic schools uh, I went to. But I think, and I hope my memory is accurate in this, but not once did somebody encourage me to ask a question. I was simply supposed to learn. And under learning was understood to be more passive. And I didn't know better. I mean, I was a happy kid. Uh, and again, I want to stress that my parents and my teachers were good people, but it emphasized conformity. It wasn't a way to prepare to go on a journey of discovery. That didn't seem to make any sense. And as I try to understand it now, I, I think that the culture in the 1950s was in many ways a culture of fear. And, and one of the greatest fears was the fear that we had caused by dropping the atom bomb. Uh, there was a sense of apocalypse. There was a sense that the world might end. And, and maybe uh, this little story at least suggests part of it. Uh, so I went to uh, Church of the Immaculate and School of the Immaculate Conception in uh, Seattle. And at noontime, when we'd be playing on the uh, playground, at 12 o'clock, the Angelus would ring. The Angelus bell, and the Angelus is a hymn uh, commemorating the time when the angel comes and tells Mary that she's pregnant with Jesus. And we would stop and we would pray. And at the same time that we were praying at noon every day, the air raid siren would sound. And the message of the air raid siren was that we had to prepare for a possible bombing coming from the Soviet Union. And I got these two things mixed up in my head, I have to admit. And again, uh, there was a sense that while I was praying, I was you know, thinking that I was praying uh, in fear that I might die any day. There was a sense of a burden that a person might carry. Uh, and if you couldn't talk about it, you would go from your math class to a bomb shelter down in the basement of the school, and then you'd go back to your English class, and you, don't, you wouldn't talk about it because somehow it wasn't something you talked about. And it was that kind of experience that I had uh, growing up. The dominant philosophy of the time was existentialism. And of course, as a kid, I knew nothing about existentialism. But as I grew to learn about it, one thing that supposedly existentialism meant was that traditional values were bankrupt. After all, look what we had done. And uh, one of the movies that expresses that idea. I will tell you that uh, when we tested this at my office earlier really today. the sound's going to work here in a minute. Uh, Paul Newman is the star of a movie called Cool Aunt Luke. And uh, Paul Newman has spent a lot of his adult life in prison for petty crimes. Uh, and yet he wants to make some sense of his life. And uh, he's escaped from prison a number of times. And we'll see if this scene will come up. Um, that says something about the, the spirit of the times. Um, but that wasn't the whole story. And, and I was particularly lucky, especially uh, as I, again, tried to see life as a journey, a journey of discovery. Uh, one of them was uh, we, uh, my family and I, lived in what I consider a great neighborhood. We lived in the central area of Seattle. 
And what I think characterizes the central area of Seattle is its diversity. Uh, I don't know precisely the percentages, but uh, the school we went to, 30% black, 30% Filipino, 10% uh, Japanese, 30% white, uh, something like that. It was incredibly diverse. And there were community leaders, uh, and there's, I guess I have to do it early and I'll mention it later too. Um, there's the Marshall McLuhan Riddle that I've said to probably anybody here who's taken a class from me. Uh, it is, who discovered water? We don't know, but it was the fish. <laughs> um, we're all shaped by our cultural heritage. And I grew up in a cultural heritage that, of course, I wasn't even aware it was a cultural heritage. But people like Fred Cordova in the neighborhood, who just died this uh, past December, uh, was a towering figure in our neighborhood. And uh, I don't know, I probably have known him since I was three years old. And he was just always there. And he was always modeling the way a person might live a good life. And so, in a time of conformity, there were ways in which I was beginning to see that there was a way out, but not consciously at this particular point. So, Fred Cordova, the diverse neighborhood I grew up in, the uh, modeling that they did about what a good life is, uh, social activism before, at least I know, knew what that word meant. Um, a second thing um, that helped, and again, it was unconscious, I wasn't even aware of it at the time, was Mount Rainier. Uh, now, those of you who live in the Pacific Northwest know that if you live in a city and you have the mountain out there, you don't always see it. But when we did see it, I think it had an influence on me. It, it gave a sense of context to my life. It gave a sense that there was always something bigger out there. And I think, again, it was an unconscious message I was receiving. So I'm grateful for Mount Rainier's background. Uh, the third thing that I think helped out uh, was hope. Uh, you probably all know the story of Pandora's box. Uh, Pandora's box is open, and all the terrible things in the world escape. And what was left in the box, the terrible things in my case, our case, was the atom bomb, and the spirit of conformity, uh, constriction, really. But what was left was hope. And I think Mount Rainier kind of symbolized that sense of context. Uh, so I'm grateful for Mount Rainier there. And the fourth thing that gave me some sense of hope was the 60s. Um, I think the 60s, and I have written a book about it, and I teach a course on it, and so what I'm going to say tonight simplifies things much too much. But we do stereotype the 60s. Uh, we think of it as a time, you know, of hippies and drug taking and uh, social unrest and so on, and all those things. Uh, so they're not lies, uh, but really, uh, I'm going to want to present the 60s in the sense that they occurred to me as the message that I could ask questions. They gave me, and a lot of other people, they gave me the message that there was possibility in a time of constriction. People could ask questions and they could just experiment, they could try out things. Uh, there was a sense of possibility that existed, a sense of joy uh, in a culture that I think had lost some of its way. So the 60s were very important to me. And this picture uh, is, for me, a symbol of the 60s. Uh, it's probably not too clear, but that's me in, in uh, first year of graduate school with my nine-month-old daughter, Serene, and uh, uh, throwing her up. And there's just a sense of exhilaration that came as part of what was possible. Now, if this were another time and if this were a class, we could talk about all the flaws in the 60s. I don't want to leave those out. Uh, they were certainly a part of the story. But for me, this is 
that what the 60s really meant. Possibility, joy, exhilaration. And that gave some direction to my hope. It said life could be a journey. But that's not just reassuring uh, because it comes with responsibility. Uh, that is, there's possibility, but that the possibility comes responsibility with the discovery of uh, the mystery of life comes pain and suffering. And, and that has to be there. But the two, the suffering and the pain and the joy, are both there. And I think if we forget either one of them, we may lose a sense of the notion that our lives are a journey of capacity, a journey toward discovery. I mean, the human capacity for evil is real. Uh, the human flawedness is real. Um, but nonetheless, again, I think it's a paradoxical, complicated, profound, ultimately, message that uh, I think is the best of the 60s, and that is that you don't explain away the evil and the mistakes and the responsibility, but you still see possibility, you still see hope, you still see that there's something we can do and we can change the world. Uh, and, and I think ultimately that's very American, and, and I think the 60s were very American. The American ex the spirit of discovery, the American sense that you could go west and start anew, carrying the burden that you came from east with. Uh, but you could start anew out in Oregon. Uh, <laughs> that's what I think, in a certain sense, the 60s reminded us of, which was Americans are pioneers. Americans are people who have new possibilities. So I, I had some, um, some hope that there were things that um, could be done. Uh, life could change. And I went to Gonzaga, and again, for me, my teaching here is a way to pay forward for some wonderful people at Gonzaga. Because at Gonzaga, I was encouraged to ask questions. Uh, I was encouraged to experience the dilemmas that come with the discovery. Um, and probably most important of all, and I, I know I say this to my students, is that the message I think I got at Gonzaga was, it's not enough to understand. It's not enough to interpret. It's not enough to analyze. But you have to care. It, it, means, it has to mean something. Uh, and I think that's the message that I picked up from people like John Sisk. I'll show a brief clip, not of John Sisk, but of the kind of teacher that he was, and of the kind of teacher maybe I hope, I wished I were. Uh, or Franz Schneider, uh, they changed my life. When I was a sophomore, I was an English major, and I was so ignorant, so ignorant. Um, I took, I, I was a double major in English because I had to take these courses. And every time John Sisk taught something, I had to be there. And when I was a sophomore, uh, I noticed the way he taught. And a lot of students found it very boring. He had a monotone. He would sit on the little ledge of the window, and he would smoke his pipe, and he would cross his legs, and he would talk. And every once in a while, he would look up, and he would say to you know, Mike Cunningham, Cunningham, isn't that right? And Cunningham's job was to say yes. <laughs> and when I was a sophomore, I decided I wanted to be Mike Cunningham. And so when, by the time I was a senior, I was Mike Cunningham. And, and John Sisk would say things and he would, for, from the point of view of some, drone on. Uh, but he just said the most amazing things. Uh, he, he, for example, helped me realize, I'm going to show you a picture of me as a jock in just a minute, but he, he helped me realize that baseball, which was something that I loved then, and I played, and uh, so on, but he helped me realize that it was a way to understand American culture, that it wasn't just a sport that would uh, entertain us or help us escape, 
but there was uh, importance to it, and he helped me see those. And Franz Schneider, I could tell many, many stories about, uh, one of which deals with the notion that a full life, a journey of discovery involves pain. So uh, my wife and I had a little baby, and we were so ignorant about children. We did finally figure out how to put the diaper on. <laughs> but uh, about two weeks before Serene was born, Margie, Margie had a daughter, Tracy. And Margie was in the hospital having uh, Tracy, and we babysat her older son. And uh, we sat and worked so hard at putting the diaper on. And then Henry stood up and the diaper fell off. <laughs> uh, we finally figured out how to put diapers on, but we were very, very ignorant and, and really worried. And I happened to see <coughs> Franz Schneider, who had six children, uh, and, Fra and I said, Franz, I'm just not sure if I can do this. Uh, uh, you know, she might fall off the bed and you know, crack her head open. And what he said to me, I think, is part of that full life, he said, could be. <laughs> he said, but most of the time it's okay. <laughs> and, and it's true that the things that we fear, let's say with regard to our children, are going to happen, more well, than likely, but it's going to be okay. And, and Franz Schneider helped me see that. Um, So here's, uh, again, I will see if this uh, works uh, better than the first clip. It's a clip from a, a bad movie. But I, I do like some bad movies. It's, uh, it's called Creator, and it stars Peter, o Peter O'Toole as a college teacher. And uh, again, this perhaps says something about uh, the kind of teacher I have wanted to be. Oh, I forgot to show that one. Uh, that's another picture of the 60s. <laughs> uh, it's camping in uh, Rhode Island with uh, Serene. Serene's uh, two at the time. And uh, you might notice I have, my hair's a little longer, and I have a little bit more of it than I do now. <laughs> this is the jock at 10 years old. Uh, left handed pitcher. And uh, I just love baseball. Here's another picture. The jock at 17. Uh, this, this picture, uh, you might notice that my hair is orange. And maybe you can't see that detail. But my girlfriend uh, bleached my hair. Uh, and we thought maybe it would turn blonde. <laughs> but it didn't turn blonde. It turned rust or orange. <laughs> and my coach wasn't too thrilled. Uh, but again, John Sisk helped me see that there was more to life than sports, but that sports could be part of a life well lived. I, I would like to think, uh, as I pretend to be a teacher, that somehow we were addressing the big picture uh, on a regular basis. Um, let me just give one more story about Gonzaga. When I was a junior at Gonzaga, I went during spring break to visit Reed College here in Portland. And I'd never been to Reed. I knew of Reed and its reputation. And I wanted, that's exactly what I wanted to experience. And uh, my roommate and I stayed up practically all night talking to each other. And at one point I asked him, I said, well, what made you come to Reed College? Uh, and he said something that I've never forgotten. And it, up to that point in my life, I never even realized that a person might think of this as something to do. He said, I came to Reed College because I wanted to change the world. I never heard that before. I think you grow up more routinely hearing that that's something you can do. And you can thank the 60s. <laughs> um, the next day, uh, still at Reed, I met a young woman who I was quite infatuated with. And we again stayed up all night talking and she became my Delphic Oracle. She taught me so much about life. And she told me that 
she talked about how life, how school could be preparation for changing the world, that school could be revolutionary. Never thought those things before. Uh, she also said something, quoted something that I quote to you regularly, and I can't remember her name, I'm sorry to say. Um, but I remember her, and what I quote to you regularly is the quote from Allen Ginsberg, the poet, who said, the purpose of life is to relieve the suffering. All the rest is drunk and dumb chill. <laughs> and again, that's the comment for me as a phony. Because, of course, uh, I don't really have enough suffering. But it's a good goal to aspire to. And I have the Delphi Dora Oracle and read it back and forth. Um, mentioned that the journey, the hero's journey, the journey of discovery uh, is not necessarily a uh, comforting one. Uh, somehow the responsibility to make the world a better place, uh, not necessarily a perfect place, although I'll, I will share a story about my naivete and I'm not ashamed of it. When Serene was born in 1969, I thought by the time she was 25 years old, the world would be a perfect place. I thought that, for sure. I said, all we have to do is raise her uh, to be free and to make decisions for herself and uh, to help her whenever we could. And that's all we had to do was raise perfect children. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, my children, by the way, we've talked about this, and they will tell you that uh, I don't remember anything bad they ever did. Uh, they were perfect. Uh, but not because of us, not because of their parents. Um, and, and I am sober uh, about raising children. I know that I can't do it perfectly. And, but I think it's a good goal. Okay, so that's the first point I want to make, which is that life is a journey. The second point is that if we're going to experience the journey, we have to wake up. We have to pay attention uh, to what's going on. Um, you can put it in religious terms, which are very appropriate to this week. Uh, the journey of the hero, and I hope I'm not offending anybody by putting it this way, uh, is modeled by Jesus, who tomorrow we recognize the death uh, that Christ experienced, and on Sunday then the resurrection. And, and it gives us a burden. Uh, can we die uh, to our egos? Can we die uh, from the pain we experience and simultaneously believe in possibility and resurrection? And, and I think it's appropriate then to speak about waking up um, and it takes pain. The Aeneid, which is one of the books I teach in the Hero Course sometimes, uh, called, says about life that life involves uh, sut lacrimae rerum. Uh, there are tears in the nature of things. To be alive is to is suffer. To be alive is to experience pain. But heroes also show us possibility. Uh, and it takes pain. And sometimes the pain is the vehicle for the discovery possibility. Let's see if this clip works. It's also from Creator, uh, a young uh, person who you saw in the previous film has been working with uh, Dr. Wolper and has fallen in love with a young woman and now the young woman is in a coma and she may die. Okay. Um, sometimes it takes the pain to recognize that uh, we have to be <coughs> awakened, maybe unpleasantly, uh, to the experience uh, of our powerlessness and the power that God can provide, the power of possibility. But we may have to look at ourselves differently to do that. Uh, and here's a scene from a good movie. Uh, <laughs> uh, I recommend it. Uh, I, I showed it to uh, some freshmen this year uh, who I, I think liked it. It's called Leaves of Grass. And it's a, a, Edward Norton is the star, and he plays twins. One 
uh, they're both from rural Oklahoma, and one twin has left, Edward Norton has left, and he's a teacher of classics at Brown University. The other brother twin, had, uh, played by Edward Norton, has stayed back in rural Oklahoma, and he's a drug dealer. Uh, they don't talk to each other, but uh, the one has come back because he's been told the mother is dying. Uh, he meets a young woman, and they talk about, well, let's see what they talk about. <laughs> now, I, the technology may not have that come through so well, but I think the point that comes through is, uh, first of all, that uh, we may have to split our, our, uh, our skin, our cicada skin. We may have to die. Uh, and find that butterfly inside of us. Uh, but it takes work to do that. And uh, it raises an issue that I'm going to talk about in just a couple of minutes, and that is, are there rules to do that? How do we do that? And we live in a world, and it's the important, or one of the important issues of our time, which is, uh, if everybody has a different opinion, if everybody has their own rules about poetry, how do we know what's true? Uh, of course, that's difficult, but I want to try to talk about it just a little bit in a few minutes as I move into the third major point, which is that the purpose of life is to pay it forward. Uh, somehow we have to pay attention to the people. So let me tell you a short story. A short story uh, which is the history of humankind. Uh, once upon a time, when people lived in small groups of 60 to 70 people. One group of people met with a new and strange group of people. They were both frightened and exhilarated. Over time, they fought and killed each other. They also traded and loved each other, and developed technology that brought people closer together. Now there are a lot more of us, and we still fight and kill each other. Is there anything we can do about this? part of this discovery. And hope is our ally. That is that last part that's left in the um, in Pandora's box. But I think there's something else. And for three minutes now, I'm going to talk philosophy. <laughs> and I hope it will make sense. It certainly needs more development. But let me try it out. Uh, heroes are important uh, because what they do is they go into the apocalypse for us. They are the ones who are courageous enough to experience uh, the suffering, to die to the ego, to experience the apocalypse, uh, to go to the place where there aren't any categories. Uh, and what they discover is how to make the world a better place. But in order to talk about a better and a best place, you have to have some kind of notion of what is better and best and that's really hard in a world where everybody has a different opinion. How do we know what's better and how do we know what's best? Um, what Claude Levi Strauss suggests is that when heroes go down into the underworld, they die to the ego, they experience the world without preconceptions. And what is that to experience the world without preconceptions? What would it mean not to have cultural assumptions? What does it mean not to have a personal identity? Who are we if we are not our cultural identity or our personal identity? And what Claude Levi-Strauss suggests is we discover that first we are living and suffering beings before we are thinking beings. And again, I go back to Gonzaga where I learned that passion, care was as important as objectivity interpretation and analysis. I'm not suggesting those aren't important. Uh, but what heroes do is they are willing to go on the journey. And what do they discover and how do they discover the truth outside of cultural identity and pre, uh, pre uh, and words we use to define the world. And if they don't know who they are as an ego, what do they discover? Is the truth inside of us, which we often say, is the truth outside of us, which is 
to be accessed through objective learning. And I think what heroes teach us is that neither one is true. We, we don't, truth is not in here, uh, although I once thought so, I did. Uh, but I don't think it's in here, and I don't think truth is out there. But rather what heroes discover at that moment of egolessness is that they're in a relationship with other people and with the world. And it's there where they discover truths that can't be said, truths that aren't ideas, but truths that are experiences. And there are these truths. Uh, I would say there are universal truths, but we can't say them. They're not the kind of things we put into words. Uh, okay, that's the end of the philosophy. Uh, but that kind of a world requires faith. And heroes can teach us about faith. So let's go back to the brief story about humankind. We met other people and we were anxious because they represented difference. And difference was a threat. And oftentimes when we perceive people as different, we are cruel. We box them up, we emphasize ideas about them. They're black or they're white, they're Christian or they're Muslim, they're American or they're Afghan. We know that we're much more comfortable with people like us. And that story must be told. And I admire, and I try to participate with my colleagues here at Concordia in telling the story of horror, because we have to tell that story, or we're lying to you. Uh, lying to our students. It's a true story, but it's an incomplete story. And what heroes discover is that truth underneath the cultural differences, which is that we're all suffering beings, and we share something as we are all suffering beings. And so if we go back to the story of humankind for the third time, for the first time in human history, because of technological advance, travel, cell phones, internet, and so on, we now truly do live in a global village. Uh, people halfway around the world, we can communicate with them instantaneously. And that changes things. And we're still trying to figure out what that means. How do we think about the fact that our neighbors uh, are halfway around the world? and people halfway around the world, despite cultural differences, are like us. Uh, that's what convicted me to be a pacifist, to be a nonviolent activist, because somehow, and certainly when I was a student, it was unsayable for me, but somehow I knew that these people who were supposedly different from us were my brothers, they were my neighbors. And somehow, when we do live in neighborhoods, when we do live in families, we don't necessarily like each other, except for our family. <laughs> <laughs> but we find a way to get along with each other. That's the challenge we have. Uh, and that's uh, one of the things that I have tried to share is this notion that somehow, if we open our, eye, our eyes, and if we try to see other people not just objectively and from arm's length distance, but with a passion and caring about other people who are our neighbors. Uh, perhaps we could do better. Uh, let me see if it works. Could you, for a second, could you get out of the uh, PowerPoint? Can, or can you see the screen? Yeah, I get out of the PowerPoint for a second, thank you. And go to the my uh, C drive or whatever. <laughs> and so the ultimate truth is the Beatles were right. <laughs> We don't have to play all, all of it. <laughs> but while we romanticize love and we talk about it in ideal terms, it's hard work. Uh, 
one of the writers I like about Ken Kesey says, love is common sense. It's doing the hard work. Uh, I think that's enough. <laughs> not, not that I would want to stop. But um, so, so let me try to bring this to a conclusion. Uh, another writer that I like, Kurt Vonnegut, talks about my pretending, our pretending. He says, thank you. We are what we pretend to be, he said. So we should be careful what we pretend. We are what we pretend to be, so we should be careful what we pretend. Maybe we're all pretenders. Uh, I've done my best to pretend to be a son and a brother. I played the role of a jock when I was young. And I learned a lot from sports. Uh, I learned that you get a sense of excellence from sports. You find yourself able to do things you didn't know that you could possibly do. And I learned that best from my daughter, Laurel, when she was eight years old. And she was a very, very good swimmer. And one day, Laurel was doing the medley, which involves the four events. And I hope I can remember the four events, the butterfly, the breaststroke, the, that it ends with the freestyle, the backstroke. And she pushed herself to the edge. And when she finished, up just a little bit because uh, I still remember this story because I learned so much that day from my eight-year-old daughter. She had come to the end, like heroes come to the end. And what she discovered is something about herself that knew that she could still go on despite the fact that she had no breath, no energy. And I think that's one of the things that sports teaches us and that my daughter, Laurel, has taught me. Um, I pretended to be a hippie. <laughs> um, and again, I tried to define hippie earlier. It's not about drugs and so on. It's about possibility. It's about joy, exhilaration, and accepting the burden of pain. Um, one day earlier this year, uh, I was wearing a tie-dye shirt and it was a still a nippy day, and so I had my grab blue jacket over my tie-dye shirt with the shirt kind of open, and I ran into an administrator at Concordia, a friend of mine. Uh, and he said, Dick, that's you. That is, you're hiding your hippiness underneath the drab outfit of pretending you're a teacher. <laughs> and, and maybe he's right. So I want to make it real clear here. say something you never had thought in your life before. They make a discovery that it's magic. And it happens in classrooms. And it's one of the reasons that it's a great role to play. Um, it's one of the reasons, too, I have qualms about the direction higher education is taking. I, I sometimes worry that with our attention to online education, we may be losing magic. Now, online education may provide for magic. I don't know. Maybe it does. But it may be paying homage to the God of individuality and the expensive community that was created in classrooms. And, and, and that worries me. Uh, or addiction to growth, which so many universities are doing, uh, I, I fear is worshiping wealth, bigness writer said that's 
thin soup. Uh, I'm not sure it's enough for to substitute for the magic. Um, the part in my life that I have enjoyed the most, uh, I love teaching. I, I, I worry about life after teaching, but I love teaching. I feel the energy of the magic. But the job I love the most, the thing that I pretended to be that I love the most, uh, not that I did it well particularly, I don't make any claims for that, uh, is parenting. Uh, I learned so much from my kids and from my grandkids, and I want to thank them. I learned something about possibility. I learned from my kids humility. Uh, I think that that's what they teach us. Um, and I want to tell one last story, which is about my grandson Skyrim. Many years, um, Pete Seeger and Arlo Guthrie have been going to concert at, at Carnegie Hall in New York City, uh, and I've always wanted to go. And this year, this last November, uh, we finally were talking about it. We said, "Okay, this is the year." So he and I went back to New York City in uh, the, the, thanks, the uh, weekend after Thanksgiving and uh, saw Pete Seeger. Turns out the last time because he died in January. And even though he didn't sing a lot that night, he is an inspiration. And uh, it was because of Skyler that I had the motivation to do it. The, the, there's that part where we can live through our students and find out what they can teach us. We can live through our children and especially our grandchildren who have all their lives to dream. About making the world a better place. Uh, I want to show a scene from, I hope that again the technology works. So are we, are we back in the. Uh, Should be good. <coughs> uh, this is from a documentary about Pete Seeger, and it's not the year that Skyler and I went to Carnegie Hall, but it's a previous year. And it may give some sense of what Pete Seeger represents. So we pretend, maybe all of us, maybe you and I both pretend, but it's helpful to remember that we're not pretending alone, but we're pretending together in community, we're collectively pretending to create a better world. And I learned so much, and I'd like to just thank people who helped John Sitter, from Schneiders, who helped me work and create many, many women in my life who have taught me uh, lessons. Discovery, mystery, possibility. God bless you.